As parents, you want your kids to thrive and be able to be independent. That takes some strong self-management or executive function skills. And believe it or not, these are skills that you can help develop anytime, anywhere by keeping in mind some key principles. Today, you're going to learn how to take advantage of neuroscience, problem solve with your children, and build key skills that are needed for strong executive functioning, and do it in real life, in real time. This is LD Expert Live. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. This book will help you understand why some bright children and teens struggle in school and what can be done to change that permanently. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. We have Brianna joining us today as our moderator. Brianna has worn all kinds of hats at Stowell Learning Center, and it's always fun to have her with us. Good morning, Brianna. Good morning, Jill. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me again today. Um, welcome, and please check in with us. Let us know where you're coming from or checking in from and say hello. You know, I have two toddlers at home and there is not a lot of executive function uh, happening at that age, but it is exciting to watch them and help them develop that self-awareness and control. I say it's exciting, but it can also be very challenging. And no matter what age your child is, executive function is an important topic. So feel free to share with us some challenges or successes you may be experiencing in the chat and be sure to post your questions for us to answer throughout the show. Great, thank you, Brianna. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, and we're talking all about executive function. Executive function is developmental. The major growth in executive function begins to kick in about 11 or 12 years old with growth in the frontal lobe of the brain. And it doesn't completely develop until about age 25 or even a little later. But there are some principles that help us stimulate and support our children's or students' executive function development all of the time. That's really what I want you to come away with today. There are things that we can do to help ourselves be more successful as we work with our kids to solve problems and to help our kids become more independent all of the time. I'm going to talk about seven key principles or skills and give you a practical way to apply them. If you have questions or comments about any of these principles, put them in the chat and Brianna will pop in periodically and will address the questions throughout the show. Here we go, number one, continuum of arousal. In the neuroscience world, attention and stress are looked at as a continuum of arousal. At the highest level of the continuum, we're so stressed that we're in survival mode, fight, flight, or freeze. At the lowest level, the person is zonked. The ideal place for learning and rational thought is in the middle, in the zone, where the person has calm, focused alertness. Emotional regulation and self-management depend on a level of arousal that is closer to the zone than either end of the continuum. As we work with students on changing their behavior or improving their attention or building specific executive function skills or habits, we can really only do that effectively if the student is in the zone or close to it. If they're in fight or flight, that high end of the continuum, it's not going to work. They're just not gonna hear you. If their arousal level is too low, or they're exhausted, 
they're not mentally available either. We have to be aware and help our children be aware of where they are on that continuum of arousal and how to either increase or decrease it. Here are some quick tips for lowering the level of arousal. Our eyes and our breath are two ways that we can consciously control our physiological stress response. Telling someone or telling ourselves to calm down never works. But as soon as we step outside or walk forward, our eyes get this wider view. This immediately downregulates the nervous system. If you can see that your child is really upset about something, you might just take a walk together. Don't talk, just walk. And pretty soon, their level of arousal will start to come down so that they're more available to talk. Breathing in through the nose and taking long exhales through the mouth is also a signal that tells the sympathetic nervous system to settle. It's that long exhale that's important. If your child is really overwhelmed or frustrated, you might just come alongside them and do this kind of breathing in through the nose, long exhale through the mouth. Don't say anything, just breathe. Your child's own breathing will probably start to entrain with yours and slow down. Movement is a proven stimulus for increasing the level of arousal for learning and attention. Dr. John Rady, author of A User's Guide to the Brain, says, exercise increases the concentration of both dopamine and norepinephrine, as well as other brain chemicals. And I have always said that a dose of exercise is like taking a bit of Ritalin or Adderall. It's similar to taking a stimulant. Even a little bit of movement, just standing up and stretching, makes a difference. Let's have Brianna join us for a minute to check in with viewers in the chat and any questions around the continuum of arousal. Yes, we do have some people checking in. We have, let's see here. Got, oh, Tajwani from St. Louis, she says hello. And then Emily, she comments that my kiddo resists structure and routines. So I definitely have been there before. I understand that. Um, okay, so we were talking about this continuum of arousal with a homeschool mom recently. And she said that it seems like her son is at both ends of the continuum at one time. He needs to be more present and focused, yet he seems like he's in high alert. And then when she tries to find out what he needs, he doesn't know or doesn't know how to express it. So do you have any suggestions? You know, that that awareness is the first step in making any change. And we can kind of help guide our kids in developing that. At the Learning Center, we teach students some different types of activities that they can use for brain breaks, like doing cross crawls or getting a drink or deep breathing. When we notice that they need a brain break, we can show them a picture or a list of two or three options and let them choose which one they want to do. Even if they're not yet fully aware of why, they will usually choose the one that they need. After the brain break, then we can do a quick dialogue with them to help build their awareness of their level of arousal or what they need to get in the zone. So we might ask, how did you know to choose that activity? Or say something like, did you notice that you were starting to move around in your chair like you were trying to keep yourself awake? That showed that you needed to get energized. So choosing a movement break was a good choice. Yeah, I love that. I, we utilize movement breaks, brain breaks, quite often in the center. Mm -hmm. So it, it really works. All right, everyone, 
keep checking in, keep saying hello, keep posting your past questions, and we will continue to answer throughout the show. Great. Thanks, Brianna. All right. Number two, what does the behavior really mean? No matter what it looks like, behavior always means something. If behavior needs to be changed, we have to first identify the real root of the problem. So what we have to ask ourselves as parents and teachers is, what is the behavior telling me? All behavior serves us in some way. This doesn't mean that behavior is manipulated, manipulative. It just means that our behavior reflects a need that we have. For example, maybe you have a child who resists doing his homework. How is that resistance serving him? It may be a symptom of lagging skills. The student simply doesn't have the needed skills to do the job. So if he procrastinates or resists or changes the subject or any other number of avoidance behaviors, he doesn't have to deal with a task that's too hard. Or maybe you'll come and sit with him and do it with him. You may have a child who tunes out in class. It could be an auditory processing problem or poor comprehension. So after a while, they're not connecting the dots right and they can't stay tuned in. They could be going through a growth spurt. So they're fatigued and they can't keep themselves alert. They may be giving in to their creative thinking style and daydreaming. They may be on sensory overload. They're just so stressed out, they can't effectively block out what else is going on around them. So their survival mechanisms kick in in the form of mental flight. We can't help a student solve a problem until we know what the problem really is. So we have to think, what is this behavior telling me about what the child needs? Number three, build, don't be their executive function. Executive function is all about your ability to imagine and play out a mental movie of how the future is going to go in time and space. Right now, while you're watching this broadcast, you probably also have a mental movie running in the background about how the rest of your day is going to look. If you have a Zoom meeting after this, you may be picturing yourself running and putting in a load of laundry and then gathering your materials for your meeting and, and then settling at your computer to start Zoom. If you're hungry, you may insert a trip to the kitchen to get a snack and mentally think through what snack you actually have time to make and still get to your meeting on time. That's executive function. That's how we plan. When children are really young, adults are going to have to give them a lot of specific direction. But as they grow, children and teens need the opportunity to exercise their executive function and develop this kind of mental imaging and forethought. We can help them do that through questioning with increasingly more open-ended questions as they get older. I'm going to show you a picture of my daughter, Christy. For most of her growing up years, we made daily trips to the ice rink. When Christy was eight years old, I might have said, it's five o'clock, so it's time to pack your skating bag. What will be in it when it's all packed? Asking the question helps her to visualize what she needs to pack. If I say to her, pack your skates and guards, don't forget your gloves and sweater, I'm doing the visualizing and using my executive function. When she was 11 years old, I might have said, we need to leave by 5.30, what's your plan for getting ready? Now she has to picture herself going to her room, putting on her skating clothes and packing her bag. So she's using that mental forethought and, and her executive function. At 15 years old, I might have said, 
what time do you want me to be ready to take you to the rink? So the questions get more open-ended as your child has more capacity to plan and think into the future. This takes practice and intention on your part. Micromanaging is a big <laughs> burden on you. So let your child share that burden and exercise their executive function. Number four, problem solve together. As problems come up, you want to problem solve together with your kids. There are three steps that you want to think about their take on the problem, your take on the problem, and collaborating on a solution. Not compromising, but collaborating so that together you find a solution that meets both needs. So step number one, what does the student need? Observe, explore, dialogue, and listen to understand what's really beneath the behaviors that you're seeing. What does this student need? Ask and listen without judgment. Don't share your opinion or give advice. You might lead the discussion with, I notice, tell me about that. I'm going to give you an example that came up with a homeschool family, but remember, you can apply this to any problem. The teenage daughter was pretty independent and the younger son, Zach, needed a lot of extra help from his mom. Mom noticed that her daughter was starting to act unmotivated and inconsistent in her work. So mom said, hey, I notice that you seem less interested in your work lately. Tell me about that. Kids don't always come right out and tell us what, what's bothering them. So we need to be good observers and explore and then just be quiet and give them time to respond. There could be many reasons for the change in work habits. But in this case, the daughter ended up saying, it doesn't matter. You don't even care what I do. You spend all of your time with Zach anyway. Now we know that the independent child needed more attention from mom. Step two, what do you need? Share with the student what you need or what change is needed. Be clear. Don't blame. Don't tell the student what to do. So this mom could say, Zach is struggling and I need extra time to help him. So just stating the need. Number three collaborate on a solution. Now the needs on both sides of the problem are understood. The daughter needs attention from mom and mom needs extra time to help Zach. So now that you know both sides of the issue, you want to brainstorm all the different possible solutions and together visualize and evaluate the pros and cons of each option and determine the best solution or strategy to meet both needs. Here are some possible solutions that this family came up with. They could start school early for the daughter so mom and daughter could spend time together. They could start school earlier for Zach and end school later for the daughter so mom would have exclusive one-on-one -on -one time with each. Mom could let Zach work more on his own. Uh, or mom and daughter could have a Starbucks date alone once a week. Together, they visualized each option. What would it look like? What would it feel like? What would happen as a result? And together, they determined the best solution and why. So the daughter rejected solution number one because she hates getting up early and she saw herself being really grumpy. Mom rejected solution number two because it extended her homeschool day and she already had a lot to do. Solution number three didn't meet both needs. So they decided on solution number four, a Starbucks date once a week that gave the daughter alone time with mom and allowed mom 
the time to focus attention on Zach during the school day. And then the next step is to try it out and evaluate how it worked. This kind of joint problem solving takes time, but it's time well spent. It allows the student to repeatedly practice the very essence of what executive function does. I have a few more tools for you, but let's check in with Brianna and all of you viewing live. Hey, you know, I really love this joint problem solving approach because we all need to feel seen and heard, especially these young kids who are usually told what to do all the time. So it really is a great way for all parties involved to get their needs met. Skills are being built. Bonds are being strengthened. I love it. And our families who actually use this approach in the home, they tell us that it works really well. So it's great. We do have a question from Tajwani. Um, she asks, how does this planning work for a teenager with a language impairment? Good question. Mm -hmm. um, you probably have, uh, I, I don't know if, if your child uh, has difficulty with language or is nonverbal, but you probably have developed ways to communicate with your child. And so you need to use whatever is your best practice for communicating with your child, but you can still use the, um, you know, use this problem solving strategy. And you may have to do more observation, just really noticing if, if there's a particular behavior or a challenge going on, noticing when it happens, kind of what, what triggers it. Is it at a certain time of day? Is it after your child has eaten a certain thing? Is it something you say? Just kind of really do more noticing and then, you know, validate with your child. I'm noticing this. Is that, is that right? Um, and then in terms of the part where you're, where you're thinking about solutions, you know, use whatever tools your child can can best communicate. Um, drawing or, you know, a few words and then you kind of validating, is this what you meant? Um, but the strategy will still, will still work, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, keep posting those questions and we'll keep checking in with you. All right, thanks, Brianna. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stoll, and we're talking about seven keys to building executive function in real time. Number five, the dopamine reward. Dopamine is a brain chemical that increases energy, motivation, and our internal sense of well being. It's a feel good chemical. When dopamine is released, epinephrine which is the same kind of chemical as adrenaline, but it's called epinephrine in the brain, it also tends to be released. Epinephrine is involved in increasing a sense of agitation or urgency and desire and willingness to go, to move. Dopamine is released when something good happens. It is also released in anticipation of things. So anytime we're focused on an external goal, dopamine is queued up, anticipating a milestone, and that keeps you moving forward towards it. Each time a milestone or a goal is reached, the brain gets another little dopamine reward. So as applied to executive function, having realistic goals and small manageable steps helps trigger the dopamine reward system which helps increase energy, motivation, willingness to move forward, and it makes you feel good. Number six, inner language. We have two types of inner language, visual inner language, that mental movie that we were talking about, and verbal inner language, talking ourselves through things. Visualization is a key factor in executive functions. This is how we plan. We mentally rehearse what we're going to do and how that looks in space and time. Visualization is also a huge factor in mental flexibility. 
the ability to create a mental picture and change it as we get more information or look at different options. Next week, our guest will be executive function expert, Sarah Ward, and she'll be giving you some great examples of how to stimulate this nonverbal working memory or visual inner language. I'm going to have Brianna jump in here to give you an example of using visual inner language. Yes. So whenever we talk about visualizing and executive function, I always think about a particular student who I had observed during his time with us. He was actually a remote student uh, working on executive function, and he had the typical executive function issues like poor uh, planning, poor time management, lots of missing assignments, um, habitually late. I, I remember he was a pretty busy kid. He was in theater and he always had extracurricular activities going on outside of his already super busy school schedule. So our clinician really focused on that visualizing piece with him and picturing a calendar or his agenda and thinking about a timeline and okay, what assignments are due on what day? What time is your play rehearsal on this day? Um, you know, and then after repetition and practice, it was pretty incredible the changes that had occurred for him. I mean, he could quickly picture and, and see the whole month ahead and point in the air to the days that his projects were due and know how much time he needed to spend on an assignment and planning out, you know, what days he needed to do them on, um, what time he had to leave for practice that day or what day his sister's birthday was. So no more missing assignments. He was making it on time to all of his events. It was the coolest thing to watch over time. That is so cool. You know, having something really concrete like that calendar to visualize is really important because even teenagers only see about two or three days in the future. So they need to really have something that they can look at and anchor and, and, and then they can have that in their uh, visual memory to refer to. The mind reasons through visualization, sorry, through verbalization, which is the other kind of inner language, our verbal inner language. As we're imaging, we're typically using our verbal inner language to talk ourselves through whatever it is. We want to teach our students to intentionally use their verbal inner language to self-question and to guide themselves in order to bring executive function to a conscious level. We want them to ask themselves questions like, what study strategy works best for me? Or what should I do differently on my next test? How can I organize my work so I can get it done in time to see my friends after school? Language also gives us a tool for evaluating actions before they happen and helps curb impulsiveness. If I do this, how will the other person respond? Will feelings get hurt? Is it better not to do anything? We want to intentionally stimulate inner language all of the time, teaching our kids how to visualize and self-question or self dialogue. Number seven, build the critical underlying skills. The best guidance and strategies in the world will not work if the student doesn't have the skills to do the job. If you follow LD Expert Live or Stowell Learning Center, you know that when we talk about learning like a, that we talk about learning like a continuum or a ladder with academics and school skills up at the top of the ladder. If there are weak or inefficient underlying processing or learning skills, it's like trying to do the job with unstable rungs on your ladder. It just makes the job so much harder and take so much longer. For example, a student with 
auditory processing disorder may have spotty, disorganized lecture notes. Teaching the student a note-taking strategy will not fix this problem. The problem is that the student is working excessively hard to get information when listening and quite possibly reading the teacher's lips. The information is coming in too fast for her delayed auditory system to process, so there are gaps and she's constantly trying to connect the dots. There's no mental attention left to think about a note-taking strategy. And as soon as this student looks down at her paper, she's lost the critical visual input of the teacher's mouth and the body language. So the first step in the solution for this student is not a note-taking strategy, but auditory training so that she can get good input to think with. Then she has both the mental energy and the information to apply to a note-taking strategy. If you're just joining us, I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers, and today we have been exploring seven keys to building executive function. Let's do one more check-in with Brianna and you, our live viewers. Yes, great stuff. Okay, so Tajwani has another question. She asks, my daughter has a planner to write down assignments, but she doesn't use it. How can I encourage her to use this tool? You know, that's a that's a really great, great question, because there are a lot of students out there that mm -hmm. have planners and they carry them around in their backpack, but they don't use them. And um, one of the things that we tend to assume as adults is that they know how to use a planner. And um, so we want to make sure they really understand how to use it. Um, there are a lot of things that could be getting in the way. You know, it depends on how much time the teacher gives for them to write things down or um, are they copying from the board or, or a slide and it's hard to hard for them to copy. Um, so, again, you really want to explore for you take one class at a time. And uh, and and so for that class, where or that subject when do they write the homework down? Where is it? Are they copying it from somewhere? Is the teacher just saying it? So find out how that works and then dialogue how they how she needs to do it. Role play it. Role playing is really effective in um, because you can't be in class with her, but you can role play with her how that will be. In that particular class, the teacher has it written on the uh, left side of the board. So she's gonna look up there. She's gonna, you know, say it to herself, look down, find it on her planner, write it, just practice it, dialogue it. And then I like for students to, um, to then visualize it and dialogue it um, just before they go to bed and before they go to school, because it's kind of when they go to bed, they'll, their mind will mentally rehearse that at night. And then it's a reminder before they go to school and just try it out with one class. But you have to figure out what's getting in her way first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Being a good investigator. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then real quick, Jane asked if there's going to be a replay. Yes, absolutely. There will be a replay available on our Facebook and YouTube. Yes. All right. There is. Oh, my gosh. Lots of EF helpful info chalked it up in this uh, episode. So awesome. Oh, Jane has something coming in here. She says, my daughter is a senior with learning challenges. She shuts down when I ask questions like that. We see that. Yes. Do you have any suggestions for her, Jill? Um, <clears throat> well, I would start with something like, I notice when I ask you questions, you know, you get pretty quiet. Tell me about that. And then just be quiet. Maybe do it while you're taking a walk or, um, or just hanging out kind of, um, and, and just listen and see what that's all about. A lot of teenagers feel like their parents are, uh, interrogating them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, then you can, using that problem-solving strategy, 
you can then share your need, which is you want to be able to support her or, or whatever it is. And, and then you can dialogue. How can you guys best do that? Mm -hmm. so. I think it's important to note too that all of those steps for problem solving don't necessarily have to happen in the same day or same hour. It's right. it's a process, especially for these for these teens sometimes who who do shut down. So don't don't be right. so hard on yourself if you're not getting it <laughs> right away. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have another question coming in from Anissa. She says, hi, how do I find out what executive functions myself or my daughter may have difficulty with? So it sounds like where can she get assessed or maybe looking for some answers? Uh, if you're just trying to learn more about executive function, uh, join us uh, next week because we are talking about executive function and we have a number of, of LD Expert Live um, episodes about it. In terms of, of getting evaluated, if, if that's the question, um, I, I'm not sure where you're located. We certainly do that at Stowell Learning Centers, um, both remotely and on site. Um, but that would be something that you could ask of a psychologist or a learning specialist. You, If you traditionally have difficulty with planning, organizing, kind of visualizing into the future that that forethought, those may be executive function challenges. Uh, but you can you can try to consciously use some of these tools that we talked about today to to improve that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for tuning in and posting your questions. If you want to keep the conversation going, join our mom squad. It's our private Facebook group, and we will post the link for that in the chat. And then of course, there's peace this month on November 18th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We will be talking about attention focus training and giving you some tools that you can use at home. Great. Thank you, Brianna. And that peace group, it's a little bit different than what we're doing here. It is actually a Zoom meeting so that it's a it's a parent support group and and you can, you know, really uh, join in and communicate with each other. Bring your your current uh, issues that are going on around this this month. We're talking about attention focus. So. Brianna, it's so fun to have you back on the show today. Thanks for helping out. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell. And here is a recap of our seven keys to building executive function. Number one, be aware of where your child is on the continuum of arousal. Number two, what does the behavior really mean? Number three, build, don't be their executive function. Number four, problem solve together. Number five, take advantage of the dopamine reward system by working towards small attainable goals so that your child can get that boost from being successful or from an accomplishment. Number six, stimulate inner language, both visualization and self-talk. And number seven, build the critical underlying skills. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Next Tuesday, we'll continue our exploration of executive function with executive function expert, Sarah Ward. We're going to talk about how you can use the holidays to help build your child's executive function. Sarah has some really fun ideas to share, so be sure to join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Stoa Learning Centers are open for both on-site and remote sessions and evaluations. We work with children and adults doing targeted brain training to permanently eliminate struggles associated with dyslexia, auditory processing, and other learning differences so that students can become independent learners and thrive in school. 
If you would like a free consultation for yourself, for your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share on Facebook and go out and build some executive function. We'll see you next week.